usually I say, open your Bibles to a certain scripture before I start preaching. I really comp still, I'm, st I'm still contemplating where to start. Because there's three different directions I, I can go in this piece of the Trump teaching. We have a few things we still have to cover concerning the Feast of the Trumpets. Someone asked if I had a chart of outlining when the Teshira and Feast of the Trumpets all line up. Well, I don't have a chart, but the Feast of the Trumpets is after the Teshira. The Teshira was 30 days of preparation for the Feast of the Trumpets. The Tishura started on Elu 1. And of course, Tishri 1 is the Feast of the Trumpets. Go back to the teaching and listen to it several times if you have to, and make your own chart. It's not too difficult if you want to make an outline of how these feast days happened. Now, <clears throat> let's look at another name for Rosh Hashanah. Of course, the Feast of the Trumpets, the way I'm teaching it, reflects, the, reflects to what's going to happen to, in the future. And that is the second coming of the Lord Jesus. And the rapture. And we can look back and see how that message stayed true through all of its history when it first was practiced as a feast celebration on their New Year's Day. Now there's another name for the Feast of the Trumpets and hopefully you have a pencil and paper because you need to, need to write some verses down and so forth as I go through these names. I don't know how far I'll get, but just in case, be ready. Another name for the Feast of the Trumpets is the Festival of the Last Trump. Most people that have heard of the Feast of the Trumpets never even heard of that. It is also known by the festival of the last trump. Write that down. And in the ancient Jewish Midrash, or Midrash, depending how you want to pronounce it, M-I-D-R-A-S-H. And what is that? It's just an early Jewish interpretation of biblical texts. And there's different ones. The Midrash. Ancient Jewish, Jewish Midrash one of the interpretations was I thought this was pretty interesting quite frankly that the left horn of the ram sacrificed by Abraham Hopefully you know the story. In place of Isaac, which God stopped, is called, in this Midrash, ancient interpretation of biblical texts, the first trump. The first trump. And it became the practice because it was blown on Mount Sinai. So the first trump was named after the ram horn or the left horn of the ram that was sacrificed by Abraham in place of Isaac took place and it was called the first trump in this ancient Jewish interpretation of biblical texts. Now, 
you have the left horn, but there's also a right horn. And the right horn was called the last trump. So you got the left horn was the first trump, and the right horn was the last trump. And that would be blown, get this folks, and this is an ancient text, that would be blown to herald the coming of the Messiah. Now some of you are already way ahead of me, and you're already making the connections in these last days. Now, from that ancient biblical interpretation, the rabbis, including the ancient rabbis, said the left horn represented the birth of Israel. And the right horn represented Israel's complete restoration. It also meant that right horn that is. It was a picture of God betrothing Israel by giving her the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai. Well, I think it meant more than that. They just didn't know it or wouldn't see it. I'm pausing because I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to take this. Because I'm tempted to go to the wedding ceremony of ancient Jewish or Hebrew people. So you got the left horn, the first trump, you got the right horn, the last trump, which represented the restoration of when the Messiah comes to complete all things. In other words, it represent, represented the giving of the law on Mount Sinai and the resurrection of the dead to these rabbis. And that's the way they would teach it. Now the horns, and this is where I was debating, and this is why I had to pause. The horns were also connected to the Jewish wedding ceremony. Yeah, I'm going to teach on that. Why not? A Jewish wedding had two stages to it. You're going to you need to spell this. I mean, you're going to need to write this down because I'm going to spell it for you. Because I'm going to mispronounce it. But it's important to know concerning a wedding ceremony. You'll see how it ties into what I've been preaching on the last two sermons. The Jewish wedding had two stages to it. The first is called the patrol. And that was basically a contract or a covenant called the, I'm going to spell it for you, C-H-I-T-R-E. First word, second word, E-R-U-S-I-N. Shitre Urisin. That's about as best as going to get out of me as far as pronouncing that correctly. And the Shitre Urisin was drawn up and the price of the bride then was paid. The groom then returns, he goes through the process, returning to his father's house, and he builds a house for himself and for his bride. 
Boy, how times have changed. Now, when the Father is satisfied that all things are completed, all things are finished, He instructs His Son to go get His bride. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? He instructs His Son to go get His bride. And bring that bride to what they call the Huppa, C H U P P A H, C H U P P A H. It's basically was just a wedding canopy. In fact, you look it up. You can probably Google it. There's all kinds of companies that make these hoopas even up today. Basically, it's like a canopy, a tent, of where they would get married under. And that hoopa was for the actual ceremony. Now that's the first stage. There's also a second stage of this wedding, and you just you need to write this down. It's called the K I D D U S H I N hyphen K E U K E T U B A H Kedushin Ketuba Ketuba. And this is where the actual ceremony, wedding ceremony, took place. Now, in a Jewish wedding, there's always two witnesses. One, aside, one is assigned to the bride, the other is assigned to the bridegroom. In our modern day, we call them different things, but these people were people dedicated and designated to help both the bride and also the groom for the fulfillment of the ceremony. You got it? Now these witnesses were also called something, which I think is not ironic. They were called the friends of the bridegroom. The friends of the bridegroom. I'll connect all this here in a minute, but some of you are already ahead of me. The witnesses are also called the friends of the bridegroom. And if you really think about it, if you look at our modern day weddings, we have a best man and a maid of honor. So some things haven't changed, even though the meanings have changed quite a bit. Now these witnesses that were assigned to the bride would escort her to the hupa, the wedding canopy, where the ceremony took place. Now, before the bride or the groom took one step under the hupa, the wedding canopy, the bride circles the groom three times. One circle, two circle, three circles. Now, they took this practice from Hosea and also a reference in Jeremiah. Now, let's just go there. Hosea, chapter 2. So you have the background on this. I think we should read it. Hosea is right after Daniel. Chapter 2, let's go to verse 19 and 20. I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness, and in mercies. I even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. Now, this was based on the practice coming from Hosea, and then eventually they also would throw Jeremiah in there in chapter 31. You go there quickly. Just write these things down. I'll all fit it here in a second. Verse 22, Jeremiah 
31. How long wilt thou go about, O thou backsliding daughter? For the Lord had created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Behold, a day comes, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after all those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write in their hearts and will be their gods and they shall be my people. And this is the verses they would use to unify and complete that wedding ceremony in those ancient times according to the Midrash. Now, <clears throat> the encompassing and that's why they would circle, or the, uh, the bride would circle the groom three times, based from these scriptures. Now, with the first old covenant, the Shitri unison fulfilled, it is set aside in a new covenant called the Ketubah is drawn, allowing the groom to take his bride home. Now you don't need to remember all this wedding ceremony stuff. Just remember some of the key points concerning this. Now according to this ancient custom, the bride and groom would then leave the wedding party, enter a private area or a private room, and consummate the marriage. Now the groom would then tell the friend of the bridegroom, which by the way was waiting outside the door, listening and waiting outside the door. There goes privacy. The friend of the bridegroom was waiting and listening outside the door that a marriage was made in Israel. And they would do this at every wedding ceremony. And then, once the friend of the bridegroom knew, he would then go out and announce it to all the guests that were there for the marriage ceremony that the marriage now was complete. And all would rejoice. One big party would take place. And this honeymoon then would last for seven complete days. <clears throat> The ancient rabbis taught that this was a picture of God bethrowing, bethrowing Israel by giving her the Ten Commandments of Mount Sinai. And then they would reconnect that verse and other verses including in Jeremiah chapter 2 that the marriage of the two were complete even though Israel became unfaithful and they finally would be punished and God separated from them and why do you think Jesus said when he came I came for the lost house of Israel think about it friends now we can see when we go to the New Testament the New Covenant <clears throat> By the language that Jesus used, by the language that John the Baptist, even Paul, that the Old Covenant would be replaced by the New Covenant. And what does that mean? And we are now waiting for Jesus to return. And do what? And take his bride. The church. To the wedding hoopah for a honeymoon. Now, if you're part of the Christian science fiction people, you think you're going to be in this wedding hoopah for seven years. I don't necessarily believe that. And you know the reasons why. 
Now John the Baptist, John the Baptist said that he was a friend of the bridegroom that waited to hear and rejoice. In fact, you go to John chapter 3, New Testament. Verse 28. Yes, verse 28. It reads, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy thereof is fulfilled. Now, understanding how the wedding ceremony, and I gave you a very brief explanation how that wedding ceremony went down. I just highlighted the key points because I want you to see and relate it to what the new covenant said. Let's read that verse again. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. What this is saying is, for our future, it tells us the rapture of the church is the catching away of who? Of the Messiah's bride. And the wedding supper of the Lamb more than likely will occur at that point somewhere in that period of time. Am I absolutely sure when it's going to happen? No. So much is going to be happening at that rapture point in time that it's going to be a whirlwind. But it's going to happen when he returns to the earth, to the earth, he's coming as a Messiah, a conquering one, and we're going to be part of his army. I mean, he goes on to say, in my father's house there's many mansions. You read that in John 14, in the beginning of the chapter. I believe it starts with the second verse. In my father's house are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have not told you so. He also says he's going to, there to prepare a place for us. And if he's going to prepare a place for us, guess what? He also said he will come again and receive us to himself. Because that's where he's going to be so we can be there also. Well, I think that place that he's preparing is the New Jerusalem. He could be still building it now. More than likely, the finishing touches, because if he turn is soon. In fact, go to John three. Verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except to be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth. I can't read that enough. Greatly because why? Of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore is fulfilled. In Jesus' parable of the wedding supper, the angels gather the elect from, the, from, the, from where? From the four corners of this planet. The bride consists of those who are resurrected and raptured, plus the saints that already went before. The guests are those who make it through all this. The ones that are still alive, the ones that went through it and stay, stayed faithful, having trust and confidence in Christ. Those without a wedding garment are those who try to please God 
unfortunately, without accepting the Messiah. And those with proper attire on are the ones going to be part of this wedding feast that's coming. And I can connect this to the sheep and goats in Matthew 25. But that's not the purpose of all this tonight. Now, when you think about it, Christians recognize most of this as true. You don't have too many arguments. Maybe at the timing of what happens, of course, you throw the seven-year Christian science fiction theory in there, then you have problems. But for the most part, they recognize this as true. But they don't seem to recognize, unfortunately, that these festivals of the first and last trumps are teaching about the birth of the church and the rapture also. Now the Apostle Paul, and we've read the verses before, taught that the rapture would occur at the last trump. And with the shout, or Torah, of the archangel. In fact, let's just go there quickly, because I'm running out of time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just write it down if you can't get there quickly. I'll read the verses to you. Behold, I show you a mystery. Verses 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised and corruptible, and we shall be changed. And then you go to 1 Thessalonians. Just write it down. We're going to go to chapter 4. Verse 16 and 17. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead of Christ shall rise first, that we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Why? Because the wedding ceremony is finally completed. Finally completed. There's a message even in the wedding ceremony of the ancient Hebrews and Jewish people. Whether they realize or not, they foretold the coming of the Messiah. The meaning of Him in the air. Finally, being with our bridegroom as He comes to receive us. And He will complete the marriage. And we will celebrate it. When these feasts of the trumpets in that particular year takes place when he returns. What day in the Feast of the Trumpets? Only God knows. But notice be true. It will happen. It will happen on the Feast of the Trumpets. He will return. Now, I could tie in the Pentecost also with this, but not, not yet. For a later time. When I do teach on Pentecost. This is not here by accident. The wedding is, God has, in just about everything that we can participate in life, has engraved his message of what's going to happen. Not just in the first coming, but in the second coming. And it's a shame that pastors do not put this all together. Because once you see all the opportunities we have to see that God's Word is everywhere implanted in human existence, outside of His Word also, we talk about the stars. Tonight we just talk about a wedding ceremony, how it... And like I said, many of you went way ahead of me and connected all the dots. How the wedding ceremony looks up like what's going to happen to the T of a future event when he returns. When our bridegroom returns. How it takes place, the ceremony, 
uh, things that are involved with the ceremony and how it completes itself when the marriage is finalized and the big after party that goes on for in earthly time seven days how that translate in God's time we'll see my friend there's no excuse Paul was right we have no excuse there's no excuse not to believe there's not going to be a second coming there's even Christians in today's Christianity or Christian world and necessarily don't even believe in the second coming they think the kingdom of God is here and now and it's already taken place if this is it I'm sorry it's not very promising in fact it's very discouraging if this is it this ain't it <clears throat> but it's coming now I know some of you are not that interested in the wedding ceremony and I could get that but hopefully you can see some of the connections to the wedding ceremony and the return of the king King Jesus if you did I want to hear from you now play a song 